Uh, thanks for coming. The uh, organization here is, I think we have, what's the total number of talks? Four or five. Um, and then we will uh, do a, a panel session at the end at, at 6.15 or so uh, when we get there. So we have uh, 15 minutes scheduled for each talk. So uh, hopefully we can stick to that if we go too much over. Um, uh, but we can shorten the panel if we need to just a bit. Um, uh, so uh, we have a lot of, we have these talks that are on this common theme um, and hopefully we'll have some discussion related to all of the talks and to general issues related to geospatial data uh, in Python uh, at the end in, the, in a panel session you're all welcome to participate in. Uh, so the first talk we have uh, is uh, Alex and you're talking about uh, larva map, right? Yes. Okay, so please. All right, thank you. Can you, can you all hear me? Is that good? I'm gonna assume that it is. Um, all right, so uh, I'll be speaking about larva map, uh, which is, I think maybe map makes it sound a little more gis -y than it possibly is, but uh, it's really, um, it's a fate and transport model for modeling um, how larva move in coastal environments um, based on uh, their behavior, uh, reacting to differences in temperature and salinity, um, and the sort of the, the daylight hours and the, and the dark hours. Um, and it's also uh, a model that's been implemented uh, sort of on a high performance uh, set of Amazon instances in the cloud. Uh, the motivation was to make it, to make it easy for uh, biologists who are not necessarily technically oriented um, to be able to study um, the effects of, of their assumptions on the way larvae behave. Um, in how they, they settle, their settlement patterns. So um, they go out and collect data about where there's um, certain fish species, marine species spawning, and they collect data about where they, they ultimately settle and end up um, in their, their late stage life. Um, and they use that information in this model to help them understand better um, how the behavior is actually affecting where they end up. Uh, it's also had funding um, to be a demonstration of a very modular uh, modeling framework that is uh, like very service, web, web service centric um, and, and uh, hosted on the cloud. Uh, we have support uh, largely from the government and uh, NGO uh, organizations, NOAA, um, FGDC, and OSRI. So the modeling system um, consists of basically four parts. Uh, there's a behavior library, uh, which allows scientists to uh, build behaviors. Let's see if I can do this without. So this, this is a behavior library. It, it's a website that allows um, modelers to build uh, behaviors based on their research and share uh, behaviors. Uh, with their co colleagues. Uh, there's a fate and transport model, which is written as a Python library, uh, a library we're calling Pagan, which is a combination of a, a sort of high-level data model and a, an actual uh, numerical transport model. Uh, there's uh, web services for job queuing in the cloud, um, and they, they implement the transport model and um, basically uh, control how, they're, how it's executed and scales um, to demand. And there's a web client um, for interacting with all of these um, elements, uh, allowing uh, the scientists to sort of just log on with their browser to, to build, uh, build behaviors, set up uh, modeling scenarios, run them, and retrieve results. Uh, this is the basic workflow. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I think probably uh, there's not you know, a reason to, to go over this uh, step by step. Um, we scale, it's a high performance uh, parallel model. So um, each individual model, well, modeling scenario is run on a single machine and we scale uh, the, the speed, how quickly we can execute that individual scenario by, by scaling up the EC2 instance. Um, basically the number of cores right now, it parallelizes with, with cores. We don't use the GPU yet. 
um, and then we scale the modeling demand, how many scenarios need to be run by uh, uh, you know, queuing up, starting new uh, EC2 instances and adding them to the cluster. Uh, this is the, the basic design of the transport model. Uh, it's modular, so each of these components can be swapped out. Um, the circulation model component is really just uh, advection um, from a 3D current field. Um, dispersion is a um, combination of Brownian motion and some, some turbulent, um, some, some turbulent uh, current that, that is subscale. It's not resolved by the hydrodynamic model. Um, the behavior is specific to this kind of Lagrangian element, the larva, um, so that's added. And the result, uh, sh this shows an element that's slightly bigger because the behavior actually can operate differently depending on the age of the particle. The particle ages, the behavior changes, um, the mass of the particle changes, and all of these things affect um, the resulting transport. Um, uh, what's novel about our approach is that we're using a, a distributed data access approach, which means the data that we're using to force the particles, basically the hydrodynamic forcing, isn't located um, in the cloud. Well, I mean, it could be. Um, but in our case, it's located in a, on a server in Alaska, and um, it's not uh, local to any of the, the machines in our cluster. And so uh, each particle running in parallel has a small chunk of data to start with. Um, when it reaches the limit of the data it has, it asks the data controller to retrieve more data from the remote server. Um, and the data controller returns a, a larger slice of data uh, in the cache that all of the, the particles running in parallel are using simultaneously. Um, and when another particle reaches the limit of, of that data, um, or the, the cached data, another request is made to the remote server, which results ultimately in, in sort of a j just enough data that you need to run the model. Um, uh, the model outputs uh, trajectories of each of the Lagrangian particles, each, each individual larva that we're modeling uh, as net CDF uh, using the CF 1.6 discrete sampling geometry conventions, and also as, as we shape file uh, point features. I'm just going to show you now. Now is the GISE portion. Um, so we've implemented this model for scientists to study uh, larval behavior, herring behavior, um, in Prince William Sound, which is really sensitive to uh, sort of uh, the environment's response to oil spills. The Exxon Valdez occurred here. Um, so they're looking at how herring, po herring populations uh, re re recruit and settle in the, in the sound. And so here are some results. Uh, this is just a. Um, we used ArcMap to generate a figure from the output of a trajectory of, I think we ran it with 100 Lagrangian elements, but um, we can obviously scale up, up or down depending on the, the nature of what, what the phys physics and behavior we're trying to capture. This is a, some probabilistic output of the model where we, we did a number of deterministic simulations um, and then reduced the results into this probability matrix to understand um, from different um, generation sites, different spawn sites, what is the probability that out of all of these spawn sites, um, herring may settle in this particular location. Uh, and this is, I apologize for how bad it looks. I didn't really know how to use YouTube, and it turned out worse than it looked when I made the video. Um, but it's an interesting demonstration of, of the results. I think I can speed it up. So basically, it's pretty straightforward. You can see there's an effect of, of the hydrodynamic forcing, um, which is transporting the larval elements. And also, you can see here at this depth profile, um, there's some banding that occurs at different parts of the day, and that is due to diel migration um, affected by the larval behavior sort of module in the, in the model. Oh. Click this, then go. Uh, so we learned some lessons in trying to do this sort of like novel project. The stabi stability of remote services is really important, um, particularly um, threads opened app servers are notoriously unstable. Um, and 
particularly with how hard we have to hit them to do this kind of modeling, particularly for large numbers of scenarios with large numbers of particles, it uh, turns out it's really easy for us to take down remote services. Um, and then it's days before uh, the people will get back to us um, and put them back up. And that ruins all of the model runs and slows down how, how, how fast you can complete a project. Um, but the distributed nature of, of this data um, and the parallel architecture made it super easy to uh, add new models to the cluster to, to expand our capacity to perform the modeling, provided the services could keep up. So the next steps, uh, I mentioned Pagan uh, earlier. Uh, it's sort of the root data model. Uh, we like to provide better support in the data model for handling basically as, as much as many different kinds of files, particularly ones that, are, that don't follow a specific kind of convention like CF, because um, it's important, <laughs> important we can access files that aren't strictly compliant. And then we, we're looking to provide more analysis tools. You saw sort of a, a small subset there with the probability map and the, the animations. But um, um, when talking to clients, you know, more, more of that stuff is always better in communicating the science that you're trying to get across. And also new types of Lagrangian elements. Um, this project was about larval, larval transport, larva, I guess. Um, but we designed the system so that we could basically arbitrarily plug in different kinds of elements, be it oil uh, or chemistry or radioisotopes, um, which have their own sort of, like, quote, behaviors, di different extra algorithms in addition to transport. Um, that can be included, in, and the way the code base is structured will, will easily allow that. And then we also want to improve performance by moving the, all the parallel work to the GPU um, in C, C code. So thank you. Is that about on time? Awesome. Yeah, so um, there, are, there are basically, in this case, we had access to a very high resolution uh, coastline, basically, a, a, I guess it's a shape file that we have in the back end that, that we're treating like the absolute coast. Um, detailed bathymetry for the Prince William Sound area and uh, uh, high resolution ROMs, uh, hydrodynamic output. So, so provided you have access to, to data with the appropriate resolution for the, the kinds of things you're trying to modeling. Yeah, it scales. You, you could do this anywhere. They would run anywhere, yeah. We're trying to build in some defaults, some, some basic things, so you could just set it up and, and run something out in the Atlantic, and it would work. Yeah? One more? It seems to me that the, the transport step isn't going to be the bottleneck, but the, the data kind of retrieval stuff. Yeah. Um, how many particles are you running on, on each node? And So on each, each node, you mean, so the question was, uh, the bottleneck is probably the, the network transport of, of the model data. And did I play around with the, the number of particles in each node? By node, do you mean the, the machine? Yeah. Sure. So on each machine, uh, we're restricted to the number of cores on that, either VM or physical machine. Uh, we're not doing any MPI, like a cluster communication. So each machine runs its own, its own separate model, standalone model. Um, but there, there is some optimization and some tuning that, that we're experimenting with, particularly because um, that, uh, that opened app transfer of data, even though it's lazy and you don't necessarily request a lot at a time, is, is the, it's, takes the most time in the model run, absolutely. Yeah, so I think some, some improved caching algorithms would, would help that. All right.